God in new life through Jesus Christ. I am privileged and honored to be able to be among great brothers and sisters of the Lord, knowing that today's purpose and the purpose only is to be able to give God his glory, to be able to allow people of this city, whether it's through sitting here in the pew or watching on YouTube, that God is worthy and great to be praised and that the answer to their problem is in this place. So, amen, amen, amen. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I'm getting ready to allow God to move in a moment of a time of a great church along with other churches that God has placed in this city for their people. The biggest thing that I have cried out and wanting to let this town, this city's officials, is that we have ministers that know their people. And instead of calling for somebody from some other state or some other city that has no idea what we're going through, it is time that our ministers minister to our people. And that is the purpose and the drive for this citywide revival. As long as God allows things to move and his miracles happen, the word is going to get out behind these four walls and going to get in the city, and people are going to know their answer is here. Their need is by him. You know, our God is an awesome God. He is a promise keeper. He's a way maker. And no matter whether we see it, no matter where we feel it, God is moving on every need and every sickness. So I come right now binding in the name of Jesus Christ every sickness that want to try to walk through that door. I come against Satan and, his, and all his little imps that any bondage that he wants to bring is going to be bound and be set back to the pits of hell that it came from. And I want everyone here to know that you're here in the right time. We're all Esther's. We're all God's children. And he appointed us at this time to change our city. And God's people are going to do that. So right now I want to ask Brother Rolleston if he'd come up and he would start with an opening prayer. And whatever God has laid on your heart to do, if it's to praise him, if it's to seek him, don't let nothing hinder you. Because God is worthy of all that we give him, of our heart. Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could stand together here this evening. Amen. So grateful to be at Transform Life. Amen. Here tonight. Amen. I'm excited about what God is going to do. I'm excited about everybody that's here. Amen. And that's what it's about, about being unified together. And I'm glad that we could be unified together here tonight. And, and in that unity, I wonder if we could just go in this mindset to be unified together, not only here in the present, but unified together with our worship and our praise. Amen. The scripture says in Psalms, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, to serve the Lord with gladness and to come before his presence with singing. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and to be thankful unto him and to bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. And so we've come to do that here tonight. We've come to lift up and praise the King of kings and the Lord of lords in this house. We've come unified together. Hallelujah, and because we do that, because we can unify, amen, that's when the Spirit of God is going to fall in this place. Hallelujah, the Scripture does it not say that God inhabits the praises of His people. Amen, and when He does that, that's when God can really do a work. That's when God can really begin to move, amen, and touch those that need a touch. Amen, the Scripture says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
Hallelujah. So with that mindset, could we just again, amen, lift up our hands and our voices. Amen. And let's welcome him in this place. Awesome God, we love you. God, we're so grateful and thankful to be here tonight, God. And we pray, Lord, that we would be unified together, Lord Jesus, in our worship and in our praise, God, tonight. Lord, to lift you up, God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, to magnify your name in this house tonight, God. Lord, God, set aside our will, God. Set aside our agendas, Lord. God, we want you to do a work in this house tonight, God. We ask, Lord, God, that you would do it. God, we plead your blood, Lord, over every aspect of this service. God, we plead your blood, Lord, over, amen, Pastor Hathaway. God, as he comes, is going to come here tonight. Night, Lord, and deliver your word. God, I pray, Lord, that we would have a glad heart to receive it. Hallelujah. And the church said amen here tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you tonight. Worship with us. Amen. As the praise team sings here tonight. You may be seated if you care to be. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. And when you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. Oh, we worship you. Thank you. 
are yours, we want you. We want you. Oh, come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours, we want you. We want you. Yes, come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours, we want you. We want you. Oh, come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours, we want you. We want you. Lord, come and consume God, all we are. We give you permission, our hearts are yours, we want you. We want you. We love you and we'll never stop. Can't live without you, Jesus. We love you and we can't get enough. Oh, this is for you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, come on, how many want him to come in here tonight? Hallelujah, Lord, consume us in this place tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working miracles, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working miracles, I worship you, I worship you, we call you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. I 
worship you. I worship you. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are.
Almighty, defender, my victory, my refuge, the one I run to, you are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. Now clap your hands up high and shout breakthrough, you are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. Oh, and when I can't see my way through, and I really don't know what to do. I look to you, break through. Walls fall down, walls fall yeah. down when I shout through. Strongholds break when I break. So I'm gonna so pray. I'm gonna pray you. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough. You are the undefeated one, my light and my salvation. When the wicked, my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Say omnipotent, omnipotent, almighty, almighty, defender, defender my, victory, my victory, my refuge, my refuge the one I want to, you, you are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. Breakthrough, breakthrough, you are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. Oh, and when, when I can't see my way through, and I really don't know what to do, I look to you. Breakthrough, walls fall down, walls fall down, down when I shout through. Strongholds break, when I pray so I'm gonna so pray. I'm gonna praise you. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of the breakthrough. Oh, and when I can't see my way through, and I really don't know what to do, I look to you. Breakthrough. Walls fall down. Walls fall down when I shout through. And strongholds break. When I pray So I'm going to pray. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough. Breakthrough in my heart, breakthrough in my mind, breakthrough in my spirit, breakthrough in my soul, breakthrough in my weakness, breakthrough in my struggle. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough in my worship, breakthrough in my praise, breakthrough when I live to glorify your name, breakthrough when I dance, breakthrough when I shout. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough in my heart. Breakthrough in my mind, breakthrough in my spirit, breakthrough in my soul, breakthrough in my weakness, breakthrough in my struggle. You are the God. You are the God. You are the God. Oh. Breakthrough in my worship, breakthrough in my praise, praise. breakthrough when I live it's glorify your name. name, breakthrough when I dance, breakthrough when I shout. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough in my heart, breakthrough in my mind. Breakthrough in my spirit, breakthrough in my soul, breakthrough in my weakness, breakthrough in my struggle. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough in my worship, breakthrough in my praise, breakthrough when I live to glorify your name, breakthrough when I dance, breakthrough when I shine. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. 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 Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, by day Saturday, on Sunday. You are the God, you are the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of the breakthrough. Oh, and when I can't see my way through, 
And I really don't know what to do. I look to you, thank you. Walk all down, walk down, down, down when I shout through. Strongholds break when I pray So through. I'm going to so praise. I'm gonna praise you. You are the God. You are the God of the I've got a fire, I've got a fire burning, burning inside of me, oh, oh, oh. I've got a fire, I've got a fire burning, burning inside of me, your presence is my passion, when you capture my gaze, you set me ablaze with your fire. Oh, 
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We are your choir. Let's keep praising him right now, Lord God. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. God, you're so awesome. You are so worthy, Lord. Man, I'm sweating right now. God is so worthy today, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I will be amiss if I don't say how great our God is, Lord God. I would be wrong if I wouldn't stand here and tell you how worthy he is with every the praise that we have, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, they were wonderful. Let's give them another hand. Praise for what they have done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That was powerful. That was powerful. Man, I stand here right now getting ready to introduce to you a man that I have known for a little while. And God has given me somebody to look up to, a friend of God, a mighty man of valor. He is one that cares for the city. He's one that cares for his church, and his church loves him too. You know, a lot of times I feel God has called people in here, and they didn't realize that. And they've been praying for something really hard in their life. Something, things have been serious. Some problems in their family. Wondering, God, what can I do? God, I'm praying on my knees. I've got tears. And God says, I have a man that's got a word for you. He's going to extend your life. And like always, we turn and say, well, God, what are the signs? Brother Hathaway is a man that God has given the word. And right now, the very questions that you have, that you need right now, he has them for because God has given his friend the word that he needs. So right now, I want to open this pulpit. I want us all to stand. I want us all to give glory to Brother Daniel Hathaway. Well, no, wait, wait, well, I want you to give glory for the man of God that he's given, that God has given I just want to honor you, brother. Go ahead, just a little bit longer. Just give him a 47th Psalm. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. I'll just tell you this is the way Peter did, talked about it in the New Testament. When, when Peter prayed for somebody and he got healed, that man wanted to get down on his knees and start worshiping Peter. We ain't worthy of that. I'm going to tell you right now. This isn't me, never has been me, never will be me. It all belongs to him because I'm going to tell you what, in a moment of time, he can take everything he's given me away from me. And, and I would be the dust of the earth again. Amen. But I appreciate the Lord here tonight. God is good. So glad to see everybody out to worship the Lord here uh, this evening. Um, now, I don't have a problem with you if during the preaching that you stand up and shout hallelujah. I don't have a problem with that. If you want to run around, you can run around all you want. As long as you, when you hit the ground, you, you walk right and you talk right. That's right. You know. So I don't have a problem with you. Raising your hand, saying, you know, I, I hate preaching alone. I mean, if I was in the middle of a forest somewhere and I preach, I'd probably be preaching alone. But I'm preaching to men and women who, who God dug out of sin, you know, and that's, that's the most important thing. So I'm going to try to uh, do it this way. Uh, I, I, sometimes I, I start off like this because I want, I want you to feel that that just to be comfortable with what God is wanting to do. You need to be comfortable with it. I'm not uptight about it. Well, anyway, an atheist was walking through the woods one day, and he was looking at everything out there, and he was looking at all the animals, and he thought, man, these animals, these are awesome. These, I'm going to tell you what, this is the way that the, uh, the forest works, and he was looking at the majesty of the trees, and he was uh, looking at the 
powerful rivers, and he just kind of came to himself, and, and as he was walking alongside the river, he kind of heard a rustling in the bushes behind him. And he turned and he saw a, an eight-foot grizzly bear charging towards him. He ran as fast as he could up the path. He looked over his shoulder and saw that the bear was closing on him. He looked over his shoulder again and the bear was even closer. And as he uh, approached a, a ravine, he tripped and he fell. And, and he fell to the ground and he rolled over to pick himself up. And he saw the bear was right on top of him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising his right paw to strike him. At that instant moment, the atheist cried out, Oh my God. Time stopped. The bear froze. The forest was silent. As a bright light shone upon the man, a voice came out of the sky and said, You deny my existence for all these years. You teach others that I don't exist and even credit creation to some cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of your predicament now? Am I to count you now as a believer? The atheist looked directly into the light and said, It would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian now. But perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. Very well, God said. The light went out, the sounds of the forest resumed, and the bear dropped his right paw, brought both of his paws together, bowed his head and spoke, Lord, bless this food which I am about to receive from thy bounty through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, God is good. God is good. I do want to thank all the lay ministry and the ministry that's here, pastors, assistant pastors. I was kind of, I had this all laid out because I thought there was going to be a whole lot of people here. So, and, that, and that's fine. You know what? I'll, the Bible says just, you know what? Who's here? You're here by your own volition. You're here because you decided to come. And I'm glad you did. And uh, turn to somebody right there near you and just tell them, man, you look good tonight. I, uh. I generally don't preach very long. I've learned that over the years that uh, I remember Jerry Stoner came and preached a revival. He's from Flint, Michigan. And I remember a saying that he used to have. He says, the mind can only comprehend as long as the seat can endure. So I'll use that as a backdrop to what I'm going to talk to you about. A young girl by the name of Sophie was born in Siberia. It's a bitterly cold and desolate area of Russia. Difficult place to be a child, but Sophie's life was going to be even rougher than most because she was an orphan in this vast, cold, depleted area. And suddenly at the age of two, she was, and this is a true story, she was adopted sight unseen by Lori Collins, a single mother in Scottsdale, Arizona. Now imagine going from Siberia, one of the coldest places on earth, to Scottsdale, Arizona. She began to develop and began to do well. And six years later, she, she, she was doing so well that she entered an essay contest when she was in the third grade. She was eight years old. And out of 10,000 applicants, she won. Toy maker Lego and the Planetary Society sponsored the event. As a result of winning, her family received an all-expense-paid trip to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to watch the liftoff of the Mars rover. Mars Exploration Rover, it was the, called the Mars Exploration Rover Mission. It was a robotic space mission. They were going to explore the geology and, and uh, the, the face of Mars. While there, she was asked to read an excerpt from her winning essay. And here is just one part of it. I used to live in an orphanage. It was dark and cold and lonely. At night, I looked up at the sparkly sky and I felt better. I dreamed I could fly there. 
in America, I can make all my dreams come true. Thank you for giving me the spirit and the opportunity. Her words did not go unknown. Because the Mars Exploration Rover A was called Spirit, and the Mars Exploration Robot Rover B was called Opportunity. There's something to be said about building beneath the waterline, and I and hopefully I will be able to strike the right chord with somebody here tonight. Hopefully I'd be able to do that. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, there's a very unusual scripture. And I want to dwell on that. If I could have it put up. 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And I want you to understand that I think that I'm going to be preaching basically from this premise tonight. The Bible here says, And of the children of Issachar, these were one of the tribes of Israel, which were men that had understanding of the times. They had an understanding of the times. And they knew to know what Israel ought to do. I'm going to tell you something. We're living in very strange times. I'm just going to tell you. I, I, I'm not going to be too shy about it. Uh, we're living in, in a day where I, I, when I was a kid and when some of you were a kid, I'm going to tell you what, I never thought our world would get to the place that it's gotten. But I want to tell you something. There are people out there, there are men and women out there that understand these times. You understand what we need to do. And, and it goes on to say, the heads of them were 200. In other words, there was 200 men that were the head over their families and over their sections and over their uh, uh, their development. And the Bible says here, and all their brethren were at their command. This portion of scripture, I believe, holds the key for me to revival. It simply says, and the children of Issachar, which were men who understood their times. We need, we need to not worry so much about what our world is doing and get in touch with what God is doing because that's going to be more important than anything else. I'm going to tell you what, if you think God hasn't got, got control of all this, you, you're, you're badly mistaken. He created it and he can take it out in a heartbeat if he wanted to. But we need to understand, we need to concentrate on what God is doing and understand the times that we're living in. To know what we ought to do. as an, You know what? I can't control what Paul does. But I can control what Dan Hathaway does. I can't, sometimes I can't even control what my wife does. But I can control what I do. They were not just intelligent people. They weren't just smart business people. That's not what they were necessarily. They were, they were smart but I'm going to tell you something. They were not just intelligent people, but they possessed a spiritual wisdom beyond what ordinary people possess. And you, I'm going to tell you what, the only way to get that is to be with God and to be around God. You can't, you can't get that without being around God. I'm going to tell you what, you're around God in prayer, you're around God in worship, you're around God in praise, you're around God in church. I'm going to tell you what, you're going to come out smelling like God, you're going to come out looking like God, you're going to come out acting like He wants you to act. You don't, you don't really acquire that kind of wisdom without having a deep relationship with the King of Kings. They were well-versed in the political affairs. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. God sets up and God sets down. That wasn't my choice. And neither was the last one or the one before that. I voted. I voted my, my conscience. That's all I can do. Who God sets up, who God sets down, that's God's business. That's not my business. They, they were able, these people were able 
uh, uh, they, 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 they were well versed in political affairs and knew what was proper and what needed to be done and all the exigencies of human life. They were able to discern what God was doing and support it and get behind it. They excelled in the knowledge of God's law. They were full of wisdom. They had a special calling and a very special anointing on their life. And God chose is the children of Issachar to be one of the three tribes to lead Israel when they went into battle. The other two? Judah, which means praise. And the other one, believe it or not, is Zebulun, which were the financiers. Because it always takes money to do anything. You want to know what's happening in the world? Just follow the money trail, and it'll lead it right back. So the sons of Issachar were so sharp and so spiritually astute that the whole nation depended on them. And all their brethren were at their command. We we need that kind of anointing. But you can't get it just by going through life and and, and shrugging off the things that God wants out of you. You can't get it without being around God. You can't get it without praying. You can't get it without fasting. You can't get it without worship. You can't get it without praise. You can't get it without service, without serving, without giving, without sacrifice. You can't get that kind of an understanding. Esther had that same anointing when she became the queen of Persia by the hand of God. She was not the queen originally, but obviously the other one had an attitude issue. So God moved her out of the way, brought Esther to the forefront. Her mission was to undermine Haman and his diabolical plot to exterminate the Jewish nation. Esther was at a crossroads. As, as whether to approach the king and, and to come before the king without having the scepter raised to her. Malachi, her uncle, told her, and here's a smart uncle, she, he said to her that if she didn't stand up for the truth in the face of adversity, that deliverance would arise from another place. Now, I'm going to tell you something. God can either use you or he won't use you. It's really not, not, not anybody else's choice but you. You're the only one that can choose to be used. You're the only one. And Mordecai uh, uh, told Esther, said, you know what? If you don't stand up for what you believe in right now, then I promise you that deliverance and you'll be cast aside and deliverance will arise from another place. Now, I don't want God to use somebody else. I want God to use me in whatever capacity that is. And if you don't stand up, Somebody will. Winston Churchill, in response to Hitler's advances in Europe during World War II, said this. He said, the most valuable thing in the world is truth. Because it sets people free. But he went on to say that the nature of truth is so valuable that it is escorted by a body of lies. Because wherever truth is, there's going to be a lie standing by to try to dissuade you. It was that way for Eve in the garden. I mean, Satan didn't, Satan told her some truth, you know, but he told, but he told her a pack of lies. You're going to be as gods. You know what the worst thing is? A biting into an apple and finding a worm? Finding half a worm. That's the worst thing about biting into an apple and finding a worm. And I'm going to tell you tonight that that the most valuable thing here tonight is truth. Justice William Douglas, he said this, he says, Nightfall does not come all at once, neither does oppression. In both instances, there is a twilight when everything remains seemingly unchanged. And it is in such a twilight that we all must be aware of the change that is in the air. However slight lest we become unwitting victims of the darkness. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. And the most powerful weapon beyond that is the truth in God's word. Because the Bible says that the truth will set you free. In John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Praise God. I'm glad truth sets people free. The prophet Habakkuk in chapter 1 verse 8 speaks concerning the same scenario when he warns about the 
fierceness of the evening wolves. Justice Douglas spoke concerning the twilight or the evening of history, warned of oppression, warned of a, a power that would, 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 would be upon men. Habakkuk warns us concerning the fierceness of, the, uh, of our enemy, Satan. Oppression is about misery. It's about hardship. It's about abuse. It's about brutality. It's about calamity. It's about harshness. It's about torment. It's about suffering of people. There's only one mention of, of this particular word in the Bible when Timothy says in 2 Timothy 3 and 1, this know also that in the last days, perilous, that's the word, perilous time shall come. The word perilous mirrors high hazards, threatening, treachery. It, it mirrors the word oppression. There are big issues at stake in our country, in our city, and throughout the world. To hear a word from the Lord calls for a deeper force, much deeper than our earthly ambitions and much deeper than our personal objectives. We must have that anointing of Issachar. We must have that understanding of our times to know how we should act. Tonight, I don't, I don't want you to hear my voice. I don't want you to hear my opinion. I don't want you to hear my conjecture, my impressions, or my point of view. I want you to get a word from God. If I'm out of the word of God, then you can prove it to him. But a word from God concerning revival for our city, for our nation, and for our world. Timothy didn't just stop with the prophecy of perilous times. He continued. Timothy tells us what men will be like during this time. He says it in, 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 in verse 2 of 2 Timothy 3. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Are we not living in those days? Men shall be covetous and boasters and proud and blasphemers and disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of God. Boy, I'm telling you what, we're living in that world. Even in the religious world, we've got a form of godliness but we deny the power thereof. The Bible says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. That's what they deny. They can go to church, but they don't, they don't, they don't have that kind of godliness that goes with the gospel. Praise God. Somebody say amen. Men shall be lovers of their own self. This is the disposition, the personality, the makeup of our world. In Peter's day, he called it, he called it, uh, in Peter's day, it was a, 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 he called it an untoward generation or a generation without direction. And that is what we are faced with in this generation. I remember my pastor, Dorsey Simmons, many years ago praying many times, Lord, give me a word. Lord, give me a word for these people. And it's not unusual in these troublesome times for someone to call and express the inquiry, do you have a word from the Lord? Recently even, I heard from several preachers, saints and civil servants, all asking the question, do you have a word from God? The question was sincere each time. They seemed to feel a loss of direction in our, our society, a loss of consensus or agreement from within our culture. They were concerned about the direction of, that this nation is going, as we all are. The light that is flickering in the deepening darkness. Do you have a word? It's a, it's a legitimate petition. We note Zedekiah who met Jeremiah secretly and asked him, Is there a word from the Lord? And Jeremiah answered and said, There is. There is a word from God. And these troublesome times that are filled with poverty and war and terrorism and addictions and moral decline and drugs and human trafficking and abuse and pollution and human rights and civil rights, racism, gender, equality, abortion. We must have a word from God. We must. We need a soul-searching move of God in this generation. We have a lot of social programs going on. I'm sure that anybody here goes to a church, you probably have some kind of program, whether it's to help the alcoholics or the addicted or the single parents. We all have programs, and there's absolutely nothing wrong. I remember a few years ago, it was a year ago or two years ago, down at the park, 
They had a big thing about hope over heroin. At a big concert and thing. You know what? And, I, and I, I'm all for that. I'm all for anything that helps people get on the right path. But I'm going to tell you what, they are, they are only somewhat successful. Our community programs are kind of fruitful. They, I mean, they're, they're profitable to a degree. Our educational programs uh, 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 for families and, and, and things of that are, are, are kind of fairly fortunate. They're, they're fairly successful. Our law enforcement program, they're partially successful as well. But I want to remind you of a story uh, uh, concerning the disciples in John chapter 6. The disciples, and I'll paraphrase it, the disciples get into a ship at even time, at the evening time. That's where we're living. We're living in the evening time of history. According to verse 16, they entered a ship at even evening time and to go over to Capernaum. And in verse 17, it goes on, it says, It was now dark. It was dark, and Jesus was had not come to them yet. In verse 18, it goes on and says, The sea arose by reason of a great wind. Jesus had not been there yet, but a big wind began to blow. I'm going to tell you what, a great wind is trying to blow you off course in your spiritual life. In verse 19, it says, The disciples began to row, attempting to get the ship to shore through their own merits, through their own strength, through their own savvy, through their own ingenuity. Verse 20, they see Jesus coming. and He tells them not to be afraid. And here's the key to the whole story. That in verse 21 of John 6, he said as soon, the Bible says as soon as they received Jesus in the ship. And I'll read it for you. Then they willingly received him into the ship. Verse 21 of John 6. And immediately, can somebody say immediately? The ship was at the land where they went. As soon as they got Jesus on board, as soon as they got the master on board, as soon as they got the savior of the world on board, as soon as he was in the ship, now you want our programs to be sex successful, we're going to need to get Jesus on board. We're going to need to get God involved with this thing. If we want our, 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 our preparations and our efforts to really be fruitful, we're going to absolutely need Jesus in the boat because when he's in the boat, then things really get done. If you don't get Jesus in the boat, we're not, we're not going to get done what we need to get done. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you about the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. While traveling I-75 recently to visit my son in Knoxville, Tennessee, and his family, I seen a sign that caught my eye. It was a billboard. And it was huge. I mean, when you're traveling in Cincinnati, uh, if you're the driver, you generally don't want to take your eyes off the road in most cases and look at signs that says, this case, I, I caught the sign. The sign read, road construction, next one million miles. It just said underneath, buy your, it was an advertisement for a tire company. It said, buy your tires here. You know what? Our personal lives are just like that. It seems like we're running into road construction everywhere we go. Our churches are like that. Our communities are like that. We're going to need to navigate around some very tenuous traffic and orange cones and barrels as we fight for another mile. You know what? If you're on, on God's side, it's not going to be easy. The enemy's going to try to stop you at every, mo at every point. It's everywhere. It's in our community. It's in our state. It's in our county. It's in our world. The enemy will not, will not rest until, until he gets it. But I have this promise that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But pastor, we need a word. You know, all I can do is preach to you the word. I can't even give you the word. I can preach to you. Whether you receive it into your spirit, it's going to be up to you. But pastor, we need revival. We need a power from on high. The call 
for a word from God is valid. My friends were serious. They desired a word from God. Why? There are big issues at stake throughout our community and throughout our world. Let me bring this just a little personal tonight. In Mark chapter 9, one of the multitude has approached Jesus. He has just returned from the Mount of Transfiguration. This man is an extremely concerned father who has a son that is vexed with a, a, a devil that the disciples cannot cast out, cannot handle it. When they brought the young man to Jesus, Jesus asked the father, how long has he been this way? The father answers, he says, since he was a child. He'll throw himself in the water, throw himself in the fire, can't control him. Jesus says to the Father, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. The Father says something to Jesus that to me is a bit of a paradox. He says, I believe, but help now my unbelief. That's kind of paradoxical. Jesus casts out the spirit from the young boy and he doesn't reprove the man for his belief or his unbelief. And so the disciples come to Jesus and they ask Jesus, why in the world were they not able to handle this enemy? Jesus simply says that there are some kinds that don't come out but with prayer and fasting. Let me tell you something, you're going to run into some things in your life that they're not going to come out until you pray and fast and get a hold of God. They're not going to come out just because you say in Jesus' name. Some things you're going to have to work for. There are some spirits that won't bow without prayer and fasting. You're going to face these things with the help of the Lord here tonight. I, I, I'm preaching to you a message called the Awakening Revival. You know what? I'm, just, I'm going to tell you a revival is going to come because God's already promised it. According to Joel... According to Joel, the Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was an evil that I write. But then he went on to say in, 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 in Joel that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now, we're kind of living in a paradoxical time. Let me, let me explain. We're facing and living in a generation that has very deep-rooted problems. When problems have generational overtones and, and, and roots that are embedded into our culture, we build systems around them to control them, control things that we cannot change. Shocking part of this story is not the demon that threw the boy into the fire and into the water. It's the fact that Jesus says that if you can believe, all things are possible. That's not even the paradox. The paradox is, if, if I may, is the cry of the Father, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. Now I'm going to tell you what, that's naked honesty. I mean to, to admit to Jesus that, that you know I believe but, but you got to help my unbelief. That's admitting something that most God fearing people have a problem admitting. We believe but now help my unbelief. Frustration is mounted in him. The father has dealt with their, this for years. He is at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. For the love of his son, he reveals what most often we, times we try to hide. Lord, I believe, but now help my unbelief. The paradox is the same person who confessed that he believed also confessed that he didn't believe. Which one is true? Believer or unbeliever? I'm going to tell you both are true. Because Jesus didn't, rec didn't, didn't, uh, 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 didn't correct him. My dilemma then is what do you do when belief and unbelief intersect in your life? Because we all have it. Oh, pastor, I'm a believer. Praise God. Nothing gets in my way. Well, I'm going to tell you what, there's going to be a problem coming down your road one day. That's going to run you over and flatten you and just keep on moving and not, not, not think a second thought about it. Let me say this before moving forward. God does not need everything in your life to line up perfectly before he can use you and walk in your life. 
We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible does not say if we sin. It says when we sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Paradox is obviously a statement of contradiction that quite possibly states a valid truth. It's an opinion which includes an, an anomaly beyond belief but is rendered as acceptable in origin. It's a mystery, it's an enigma, it's an ambiguity that, that appears inconsistent. Charles Dickens, in his book in 1859, wrote a tale of two cities, and he opened up the first chapter with this statement. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. I'm going to tell you right now, we're living in the best of times, and we're living in the worst of times. In my short lifespan, I've seen in the last ten years probably some of the worst things just still how can a father treat a son or a daughter the way they do I, I, it's beyond my capability of understanding but we're also living in the best of times we're living in a time when Jules said I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy the old men are going to dream dreams and come to dream and we've entered the old man era got some out there you know but I'm going to tell you what that's what we're, our generation is we're having revival but there's also a lot of people in desert places that are, that are in the wilderness that statement quite adequately describes the city along with many others there's a spiritual battle going on for the souls of our city the apostle Paul put it like this he said this now, let, now you, you don't think this is Lord I believe Help my, my unbelief. But Paul said this. He said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, I know that to be true. But he went on and said this. That which I would, do, would not do. In other words, something that I would not do. I do it. I don't get it. How can I do it when I know I'm not supposed to do it? And then he went on to say, that which I should do, I don't. So Paul was in the same predicament. This conflict was the paradox that surrounded Paul's life. The paradox of revival is that we must first understand that real revival starts with you. It cannot start anywhere else. It has to start inside you. It's not going to sweep you off your feet. You're going to have to seek it. And right in the middle of the word revival right smack dab in the middle of the word revival is the letter I. That's where it has to start, with I. It must be Christ in you, the hope of glory. It must be Christ in me, the hope of glory. It must be Christ in us, the hope of glory. Revival will not come to pick or any other nation or any other city without it starting first in you. Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again. And again, another paradox. What do you mean? In John 4, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. He comes to Jacob's well for a drink. A woman meets him there who is a Samaritan. Jesus asks her for a drink. She responds with a little bit of an attitude by saying, hey, you're a Jew. And Jews don't have no dealings with us Samaritans. You know? Kind of sounds like our generation, doesn't it? Jesus offers her living water. It's a paradox because she thinks he's talking about the water in the well. He is really talking about living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Ghost. He's talking about the power of God, the Spirit of God that lives inside. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about living water. He's not talking about the natural water. But sir, she says, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Jesus says to her, whosoever shall drink of this water will thirst again. But the water that I give unto you shall be a well springing up into everlasting life. And she turns around and says, sir, give me this water. I want that water. Jesus Goes on and reveals some personal issues no one else would know. 
and she perceives that he is a prophet, and he tells her that true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. He reveals to her that he is the Messiah. Because she says, hey, I, I've heard, they've been talking about somebody coming. So I wanna, you know, I'm he. The Bible says something very interesting about her. The Bible says that she left her water pot. That's what the Bible says. You read it in John 3. She left her water pot. Why? Because when you got the well, you don't need a water pot. There's too many water pot Christians already. That's all they want to do is come to church every week and get filled up. And then they go home and they run out and then they got to run back to the well. Why don't you just get the real well? Why don't you just get the, the well springing up into life inside of you? That's the Holy Ghost. That's the power of God. That's the Spirit of God. You don't need a water pot. You got a well. I don't want to be a water pot Christian. What is the well? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Preach, Peter preaches about the well in Acts 2 and verse 38. He said, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the well. The Holy Ghost is the well. The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost will lead you, the Bible says, and guide you. It's the only thing that can lead you and guide you into all truth. You want more truth? I do. I seek truth every day of my life. In time, revival will be marked by God pouring out His Spirit on all flesh, according to Joel. Peter preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. The Bible says, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Oh, but I haven't done anything wrong, Pastor. We all need to repent anyway every day. Paul said, I do it every day. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But there is one coming after me that shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I want to close this message here tonight with these points as our musicians and our singers are coming. In order for your church to experience revival, you must be in a state of revival. You must, you know what? You're going to look out of place when you're in a spirit of revival. You're going to look weird. When I first preached at my mom's church years ago, they knew I was weird. Did you know I just told them up front, I said, you've been prepared for anything because I don't have a problem getting out here and talking to you and preaching at you. I don't, have a ta- I don't have a problem preaching you the truth. One day I preached 21 things I believe that the Bible says that are true that we have, we have horribly failed at. And I, I, I'm just telling you, when you're in a spirit of revival, you're, you're going to look weird. You're even going to act weird. I is in the middle of revival. It must start with you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. How, how, how does it start in me? Repentance. That's how it starts. Repentance is change. That's, that's what repentance is. It's turning around. It's, it, it, repentance is a prayer of conviction. A lot of people pray for change that doesn't include them. Isaiah said, Lord, change me. I'm the one that needs change. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit or an attitude in me, a right attitude in me. The change that comes through the prayer of repentance is uncomfortable. Because it's going to change you. It's uncomfortable. You know what? Change is uncomfortable. You get used to doing things the way you want to do them. Because it feeds off of the premise that You are not your own. You were bought with a price. John the Baptist came preaching repentance. Why? Because he was the forerunner of the revival that Jesus Christ himself would bring. And what was his message? Repentance. Repentance leads you to baptism in Jesus' name, which leads, turns, leads you to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
said, well, we have a lot of people in our churches that say that they're believers. I don't have a problem with you saying you're a believer. I'm glad you're a believer. But a lot of them don't know that they can receive the, the, the Holy Ghost. Oh, I thought believing was having the Holy Ghost. No. You know why I know that? Because in Acts chapter 19 and verse 2, Paul, after receiving the Holy Ghost, asked certain disciples, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God in you since you believed? That's not my words. That's God's words. Have you received it since I believe? I'm going to tell you what, I don't know how anybody lives a life that's overcoming without the Spirit of God on the inside. Come on. Praise God. We must have the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit working on the inside of us to have revival. When you are revived, the church is revived as we stand. As we stand. When you are revived, the church is revived. When the church is revived, our community is revived. And when our community is revived, our nation is revived. And I plead with you here this evening. We need the spirit that Issachar had. We need that spirit of truth. That spirit that guides us and leads us every day. You worship as our praise team begins to sing here tonight. If you want special prayer tonight, you can come to this altar and receive it. Do we have any other elders from other churches that would like to come and pray with their congregation or anybody that's here? Would you come right now? If you have, if you need prayer tonight, if you need us to hold your hand and pray over a situation, maybe you got some circumstances in your life that you want God to work out. You know what? We can do it, but we're going to have to, we're depending on each and every one of us. Everybody depends on one another. Would you come? Would you come right now? Would you gather around in prayer here Before tonight? Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. We have some elders from our church if you'd like to have prayer tonight. overwhelming, never-ending, love of God Oh, it traces me down Fights till I'm found Leaves a 99 I couldn't earn it And I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never ending When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. Come on, he's been good to us. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, breathless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn. I don't deserve it, still you 
There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after me.
put in earning, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the spirit within this place right now moving. As God, I'm going to ask the praise team just to continue playing. Thank you so much. There's people right now that have come up and they've got situations in their home that they don't know what to do. There's people that came up and they've been sick and they're wanting an answer from God to heal them. I have felt the spirit of God moving over this place so strongly, praising him for being in the midst of us. So I'm asking the brother and sisters here, take what you have felt in this place. And when you walk out, remember that there is another person out there that needs what you have felt yes. tonight. Come on. That needs the healing of what you have received tonight. Yes. I don't want you going out of this place thinking, well, this was just, this was just emotion. This has never been emotion. This has been the spirit of God moving and touching everyone here. I have been privileged to be the president of the Pickle Associate Churches for going four years. But I have never had much honor and joy in my heart when I can sit here and feel the presence of God move amongst us. Take this with you. Tell people what you have felt. Let the city know that heroin can't outdo what God has for them. Let them know that there's no spirit that can divide a family like God can put them back together again. Let them know that there's no sickness that can take out a person that God never meant to heal them. So, I want to give praise to, to my God and thank him for what he has done. I know that usually when you have people having these types of services, they want to ask for money. And I want to tell you something. I was going to ask for money because it does not cheat to, to run revivals and things like this. But I'm not going to do that. I want to tell you and ask you what I want you to do. Instead of giving a financial donation, Give the Spirit of God to somebody else. Let the young ones know, I have something that can help you through your schools. Let your neighbor know, I have something more important than any money can buy. As God allows, the Spirit is going to move on the city. And we will see the change that was intended for who we are of this city. Thank you, Pippa Apostolic, for what you have done. Thank you, Brother Hathaway, for the beautiful word of God. Let people know that we have had this revival. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on the Indian Nation Station. Encourage them, instead of playing their games, instead of watching some Sing or sing. Have them tune into this. And let God change their life. Amen. I want to thank you. Thank you, Brother Whitten. Thank Brother Hamilton for this beautiful church and all that he's given. I want to thank Brother David Porth from the What's Grace Methodist Church who was here yesterday. I am so privileged to be among wonderful people. I am going to dismiss you to go outside of these doors, never to be the same as you came in these doors. And go touch our city. You are dismissed.